Welcome tonight to our event on defending human rights in Myanmar. I'm Michelle Ford. I'm the director of the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre, which is hosting this event. Uh, we're very lucky today to have an expert panel uh, who's going to discuss this issue. Uh, but before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge that we're gathering here on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to people, um, to leaders past, present and emerging. Uh, to our speakers today, we have a chair, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Tui Tui Thain, who is an Associate Professor in International Business at the School of Management at Curtin University in Western Australia. Tui's research is interdisciplinary and examines the role of responsible business in building sustainable businesses and communities, especially in developing countries like Myanmar. Born and brought up in Myanmar until she migrated to Australia in 1988, she is internationally known for her work on foreign investment in Myanmar and has published in leading scholarly journals. She is also well known as a respected commentator in international and national media on current events in Myanmar and its economy since the military takeover on the 1st of February 2021. Trey has been interviewed on ABC, CNA, BBC World, CNBC, TRT World, among others, and her expert comments have been quoted in a range of um, press outlets around the world. Our first panelist is Manny Mao, who is a Myanmar researcher in the Asia Division of Human Rights Watch. Manny's research focuses on widespread human rights issues in Myanmar, including atrocity crimes committed against the Rohingya and other ethnic minorities arbitrary arrests and detention, torture, sexual violence, freedom of expression, and labor rights. Since the, the military coup, she has focused significantly on the renewed military abuses against the population that amount to crimes against humanity and war crimes. In addition to her research, Manny works closely with other non-governmental partners and civil society groups on international advocacy campaigns to create pathways for accountability for victims of human rights abuses. Our next panelist, uh, a very warm welcome to Dr. Tun Ang Shui, who was born in Mandalay. Um, he enjoyed the general practitioner and general health practitioner life for 16 years before coming to Australia in 2008 for further study on public health. He works with the Uni University of New South Wales for a program that focuses on sport for development and peace. In 2013, he was able to introduce the ideology and practice to Myanmar. When the military's attempted coup occurred on the 1st of February last year, he was working with 19 Myanmar universities to promote social cohesion, resilience building and youth leadership among the university students, as well as serving as a consultant to formulate a national framework for social cohesion in Myanmar. In July 2021, the National Unity Government of Myanmar appointed him as their representative in Australia. And our third um, panelists, not least, but last is Chris Sedoti, an international human rights lawyer. Chris is a member of the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar and was a member of the United Nations Human Rights Council's Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar from 2017 to 2019. Since July 2021, he has been a commissioner on the United Nations Human Rights Council's Independent International Commission of Inquiry on the Occupied Palestinian Territory, including East Jerusalem and Israel. He's an adjunct professor at the Australian Catholic University. He has been Australian Human Rights Commissioner from 1995 to 2000 and Australian Law Reform Commissioner from 1992 to 95. He has also worked in non-governmental organisations, including as a director of the International Service for Human Rights based in Geneva in Switzerland. Um, thank you so much for coming in person. Uh, all of you know that post-COVID, lots of people have great intentions. Not so many people arrive in practice. Please be aware, though, that we do have a large online audience. And the way we're going to structure this is Choi Choi is going to um, engage in conversation with our panellists for around half an hour. And after that, you'll have an opportunity to ask your questions of the panelists. Um, we will intersperse questions from the audience here in person with the online audience. And when we get to that stage, just be aware that we'll collect the questions in groups of three and then give the panelists an, an opportunity to respond to your insights. Um, please do ask questions though, rather than making commentary, there'll be time for chatting with the panelists later. So if you've got an extended opinion that you would like to share with one of them, keep it for after the formal session. Okay, uh, without any further ado, I'll hand it over to our very able chair, uh, Associate Professor Tui Tui Feng. Off we go. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for your 
warm welcome and generous introductions. Um, so we're going to have an interactive session now for about half an hour. So we have our three panelists here. So my first question to Dr. Tuong Shui. So as a Australian representative of NUG, NUG stands for National Unity Government, could you tell us a bit about what NUG is and what its missions and the journey from the formation to now? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Trey. Thank you so much for asking this important question. So to get a broader picture about NUG, I would like to start with the 2020 election. So in November 2020, Myanmar civilian government uh, hold the election, general election, and then the National League for Democracy led by Aung Thaung San Suu Kyi went, the, went with the landslide victory. And then according to the plan, the 1st of February is a commence, commencing date of the federal parliament. And the 1st of April, the new government going, going to come, uh, come into the office. So that is a plan. But as we all know, very early, hours of the 1st February, a few hours before the commencement of the federal parliament, the military attended to coup. And then after that, there are uh, elected politicians and member of parliament, they are still in need either. So they call the emergency parliamentary sessions via online. And then they selected the, the, the representative, some representative of the MP and the form the committee representing the federal parliament. And then that committee, the first important task is declare a statement that that attempt at coup is not, uncon uh, it's unconstitutional. And then the president, who we mean, and the government, it's the official government of Myanmar. So that is the first step. And the second step, the, the CRPH, the committee representing the federal parliament, make an announcement that uh, they abolish the committee abolished the 20, 2008 constitution, which is written by military for more than 20 years, with full of intention to control the control Myanmar permanently. So the committee representing the federal uh, federal parliament abolished the 2008 constitution, and then 31st of March on the same day, the committee uh, and make an announcement about the Federal Democratic Charter, so FTC. So FTC, that charter has a two parts, part one and part two. Part one includes the basic principle of the basic principle for formation of the Federal Democratic Union of Myanmar. And then also that includes the political roadmaps, so the 12-step political roadmaps to, to, uh, to form the new Federal Democratic Union. So this is very, very important. And then part two is about the structure of the, the interim government. So in the 12 step political roadmaps, we have a three phases. So interim phase and the transitional phase and then the full-fledged Federal Democratic Union phase. So according to the Federal Democratic Charter, the national unity government was formed by the committee representing the uh, federal parliament on 16th of April. So the legitimacy of the NUGs come from the 2020 elections and then the elected MP. And then that government NUG is formed based on the Federal Democratic Charter. And the charter part one has a basic principle for formation of the Federal Democratic Union, which is really important. According to our minister, Dr. Liamun Sakao, Minister for Federal Affairs, he repeatedly uh, told that during the peace building phase in President Tengsen era and then the civilian government of San Suu Kyi uh, in long peace conferences, there is no agree point for this basic principle. It took seven years and then nothing came out. Came out. But in this spring revolution, in February and March, within two months, all these key stakeholders, they're able to uh, discuss, and then they finally, they got a consensus for the basic principle. So that is really great move for the new Federal Democratic Union. That's a, a new team. Thank you, Dr. Chon. So now you've clearly laid out 
kind of how abrupt this democratic process has been, um, you know, disrupted, and then Myanmar people got robbed of the, you know, the the looming democracy that we thought we were on, and that path we were set to fly off, and then that was rudely and you know disrupted. So, so after the coup, violent attacks on civilians followed, and I would like to ask many. This what's happening in Myanmar since the coup that marks the human rights crisis. How does it so? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, where do I begin? Um, I think Chris probably can answer to some of it happening from prior to the coup. Um, it's the same military perpetrators. Um, who were not held accountable. And I think a key issue with Myanmar's human rights um, history is that there's a culture of impunity mm. where the perpetrators are not held to account. And in this circumstance, it's very clearly the military perpetrators. Um, but we saw very quickly after the coup that... Um, you know, as you said, the violent crackdowns on protesters, um, they became deadly. And one of the first things that I documented was in March. So just, you know, about six weeks after, where in um, the outskirts of Yangon in an industrial sort of area called Limbaya, um, you know, there's a big labor rights movement there. There are many, many working class and um, internally internal migrants who come to work there. Um, they put up a really, really strong resistance. And um, the military saw it as a threat. It was very well organized, partly due to the fact that the labor rights groups had helped to organize the protests. Um, but we were able to document how the military actually trapped them in, trapped the protesters in, and then started firing on them with semi-automatic weapons, um, with live rounds, and then wouldn't allow them to run away. So very early on, we saw that this was their method and tactics with peaceful protesters. Um, soon after that, it became far more targeted with, um, you know, looking to arrest key leaders of the groups. And then eventually, we saw that they shut down the internet altogether. And, you know, if you look at other belligerent governments like perhaps um, Iran in recent times, you can see that the internet is a tool that they use in which they shut out information to cover the real atrocities that are happening. And this is sort of where we're seeing a key difference in the attention that's being paid to somewhere like the Ukraine, because, you know, this is an invading force in Ukraine. Ukraine wants to show what's happening. So they're allowing independent human rights investigators into the country, journalists, um, they haven't shut down the internet. But actually, I would argue that if we had the same access into Myanmar right now, we would see very, very similar levels of violence. Thank you, Manny. I noticed when you, when you talked about Myanmar military's human rights violations, it does go back. There's a history of you know, uh, abuse and uh, violations. So this leads nicely, or not nicely, but Myanmar issues never nicely, but anyway, nicely into Chris's, the question I have for Chris. Um, Chris is one of the key authors for the Myanmar, uh, for the United Nations fact-finding mission report. So that was initiated when Myanmar military attacked Rohingya minority. So that um, hit the world uh, media headlines. And um, the United Nations commissioned this report to find out the extent of the violations and who is doing it and why and what's happening. So that's around 2017, 2018. So there are actually two reports in the one after another headed by Chris. And um, we would like to know more about, um, you know, what, what you found and the process of it. And also, shall we reflect upon 
thinking when you're writing this report, did you feel a little bit of inkling what's coming in February 2021? Or you authors are also caught by surprise when this, like everyone else, you know, when the, the coup happened. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Tui Tui. Um, what did we find? We, we found going back a long history. Um, our, our mandate was to look at recent events, was what was said when we were established in 2017. And we took recent events as starting in 2012. Uh, it was not possible to look at the Rohingya situation without going back at least to 2012. And of course, we had to go back further. But nor was it possible to look at other situations within Myanmar. Our, our mandate was not just the Rohingya, but 2012, 2013 saw the breakdown of long-standing ceasefires, particularly with the Kachin, um, an escalation of violence at that stage. It, it, it marked a significant deterioration uh, in the relationship between the Burma ethnic military and the ethnic nationality armies or ethnic nationality organisations in Myanmar generally. And I, I think it's important to understand Myanmar in those terms. The military is embarked upon a Burma Buddhist nation building project. It has never been embarked upon a Myanmar nation building project. And the actions over decades by the military has been about building a Burma Buddhist nation in which ethnic minorities are at best tolerated, but generally subordinated. And this, this is the history that we had to examine. Um, the remarkable thing of the last almost two years now is that that long-standing historic attempt to divide the people of Myanmar has collapsed because the actions of the military have been so outrageous directed equally at Burma and non-Burma peoples, that Myanmar has never been so united. But the history is a long history. It stretches back to a permanent state of civil war since Myanmar's independence, uh, exacerbated at different times, directed at different groups, but a permanent state of civil war. Has what has occurred been expected? Look, the basic starting point is that the Myanmar generals are utterly irrational. Um, it can't be looked at in any other way. There is no country in the world that I find as unpredictable as Myanmar, simply because the ordinary rules of governing and even of controlling do not apply. Um, these guys, they're, they're all men, but these guys do not operate according to any known principles of statecraft. Um, they, they consult soothsayers regularly, um, and men online certainly would have been well advised as to the timing of the coup by his soothsayer on that particular occasion. I mean, you, you see the product of the soothsayers in Myanmar um, in decisions taken by the first dictator, Nguyen, Win, um, to move everybody from driving on the left-hand side of the road to the right-hand side of the road because one morning the soothsayers helped, said that to him, and that afternoon they all switched to the other side of the road. This is how Myanmar has always been governed by the generals. So the first thing is that they are irrational. The second thing is that they are incompetent. Um, no, no ruling elite in the world can claim to have taken over um, an extremely rich country, because in 1962, Myanmar was one of the richest countries in Asia, um, and turn it into one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, they can't run an economy. They can't run a polity. And the fact that we've had 70 years of civil war in Myanmar indicates that they can't even run a military. So when you're dealing with irrational, incompetent fools, of course you can't predict what they're going to do. Thank you, Chris. I can also add that they are also too much aloof that they didn't realize the resistance, the level of resistance following the coup. So it, the CDM wasn't expected. And UG formation was never expected. So, yes, so all of that, that in, incompetency, so you can see it is playing out very sadly in the world stage. Um, so, Chris, also your UN fact finding mission report, for the first time, you highlighted where military got their money from. 
to attack, to fund their military operations. So the first time the issue was brought to the world's attention. And then now the, the coup happened and since the publication 2019 was 17 first report and the second report 2019 and the latest one just a few months ago. So those reports were cited when we call for sanctions by the Western government. Could you tell us just very briefly a bit about the, the economic interest of the military? We thought it was important to look at what was sustaining military power in Myanmar. And it was not just political power or military power, but also economic power. Uh, the, the first dictator um, took what he called a socialist power, although it wasn't really, but it meant that the economy was under full military control. Um, we have since around about 2000 seen a, a greater decentralization or greater plurality in the economy. But the military still in 2018, 19, when we were doing that work, still was the predominant economic actor in Myanmar. And it seemed to us that we needed to, to map where the military's money was coming from to be able to address the question of military power within Myanmar. And, and that was our purpose, um, to, to cut off the flow of cash uh, as a way of establishing the military as the kind of military you would expect in a democracy, which is a military under civilian and parliamentary control. One of the reasons why the civilian government in Myanmar had such difficulty, difficulty in controlling the military is that military did not depend upon the civilian government for its income. And so it had no power over the purse strings. So that's why we looked at it. And we were able to identify um, a very large network of military corporations uh, and then to target in our recommendations, cutting off the economic supply, the cash supply to them. But it was a start. We don't think that we did more than scrape the surface, but it was a start. Yeah. But that has become now a highly cited, highly referenced um, document when you call for cutting economic lifeline to the military. So now going back to Seattle, um, so now you've talked about NUG formation and in the fight for the bringing back the democracy. Now, could you tell us a bit more narrowly on defending human rights and the purposes of uh, NUG with the purpose to defend human rights in Myanmar? Thank you. Thank you. So NUG, as I told before, NUG was formed uh, based on the Federal Democracy Charter. And then the two main responsibility of the NUG is to counter the military attempt at good. And the second is to bring the country to the transition phase, transitional phase. So in this phase, the first step is to call the Constitutional Assembly to draft a new constitution and then organize a national referendum and then organize the election and then form the full-pledged Federal Democratic Union. So these two main responsibility, the human rights is cross-cutting issue. That is why NUG set up the Ministry for Human Rights and then recruit Huang Myumin, who is well-known human rights defender for many years. So he appointed him to lead the ministry. And then if you look at the ministry, the human rights ministry vision and mission statements, these statements truly reflect the uh, universal uh, human rights, universal declaration of human rights. And then the main responsibility of the uh, Ministry for Ministry of Human Rights, three uh, key area. The first one is setting up the mechanism to defend the human rights and also the records, the human rights violation in Myanmar. So each and every Myanmar national in Myanmar and also Myanmar diaspora across the world able to inform the ministry regarding the human rights violation happening in Myanmar. So that is one of the mechanisms. Second one is the ministry working very closely with international actors, including IWM and then the other uh, human rights body, including ICC, ICJ. So to the main aim is to end the impunity. So Myanmar military as many, and then the Chris told before, mm -hmm. they committed 
uncountable war crimes and crimes against humanity for more than several decades. Mm -hmm. And then they are still under the impunity. So this is a time to end the impunity. So that is one of the main tasks of the Minister of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. and the third one is to, uh, to, to integrate human rights values and principles in each and every NUG policy. So for example, NUG announced a policy position for Rohingya in uh, 3rd of June last year. Mm -hmm. So in this policy position, and you clearly highlight every human being in Myanmar, mm -hmm. they have equal rights and then equality. And then they should have uh, all the basic human rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Chun. So now we've heard of NUG's journeys, achievements, and embeddedness of human rights at the center. And um, you know, you have gone on this journey for since you know, uh, nine, 19 months or so now. There's a question for you, Manny. Do you think international community, how do you think international community perceives the efforts of NUG in defending human rights? I mean, what are the achievements? And, you know, um, you can be friendly, but you can be critical and then saying, you know, how NUG has gone. Could, could they have done better? Thank you. Oh dear. <laughs> um, um, so I have a couple of comments. Um, one is that I think the NUG has done a tremendous job, actually, to come and really challenge the military and its perceived authority in the country and to say, no, actually, um, there's a whole cohort of people who will work together and fight against these you know, xenophobic ideals that you've been perpetuating for decades. So that's been wonderful to see. Um, I think that as someone who works in this space, um, possibly it's my own fault. Um, I need to do more at being able to speak to the NUG and access them publicly as well. And actually, that's been something that I think a lot of um, governments have been struggling with, right? Because generally, you'll meet any foreign ministry and they say we recognize the state not the government etc so it's been really frustrating I think for our NUG colleagues um, in getting access in the very early days to other ministries and being recognized as the government that they are um, and there are many technicalities as well and again I think uh, Human Rights Watch has a, a, a way to go with this as well because I would like to publicly recognize the NUG as the government, but I can't publicly because we're not a government. Um, so there's a few things that I think um, relationship-wise we can work on. One thing that I fear for the NUG is that um, Chris talked about this bermanization of, of the country. And I think that because so many people who are in the NUG are older members, um, of the NLD and older, sorry, generationally as well as long-term members, they may fall into this trap. And we've seen it when there's been discussions arising about, you know, yes, the Rohingya recognition, um, but also recognition of them having um, a citizenship. There's been issues around women's rights and some other ethnic issues as well. So I do worry that you know, once we actually have a, a, a governance and position, um, they could fall into that trap of the modernization of the cultural element. And I think that also comes down to trying to engage younger, uh, more invigorated youth. Um, but with youth at the moment, it's, it's really difficult because they are in a culture of such high violence that possibly they're not going to be the, the better ones to be running a government in the future. Um, we also saw this when the political prisoners who were all former NLD members came out of prison, you know, um, they had many ideas, a lot of energy, but possibly were they the right people to run the country? I'm not sure. We had more than 100 MPs who were former political prisoners who'd served 
in solitary confinement. And those types of issues were not addressed. So I think we'll have a lot to face going forward. For sure, thank you. Now, Siatun, let's, let's be excited now, okay? This is a time that the, the, you know, the temperature has heightened. Please respond. So we, uh, many has talked about access. I've read about that as well. Hard to get access to the ministers, the the the, the composition of the you know the um, high-ranking personnel in the youth, you know, um, Rohingya um, issues. Would you like to address um, strongly, please? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, many. So I would like to share my personal experience. That me around 1995. At that, at that time, I was running my, my general practice in Kachin State. And then one of my friends, who is Shan Ethnics, and we, we uh, one day, I didn't see him in the village. And then I asked my, 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 some, some of my friends. And then my friends told me, be on the run. Why? So he's teaching Shan language for his community. And then that is crime in Myanmar. I didn't know. I didn't know that kind of situation. So teaching the ethnic languages is a crime. Mm -hmm. Under the socialist regime, under the military regime in 1995. So I absolutely agree with the words Bahmanization. Mm -hmm. But today, the spring revolution, Myanmar, especially the social cohesion landscapes in Myanmar is changing and then moving towards the right direction. Because now people in Myanmar are getting understand that the Bahmanization is a mechanism, especially intentionally created by military. With this mechanism, they like to control the, control the power, control the country. So if the ethnic minority and the majority Bama, there is a conflict between this kind of ethnic uh, based conflict. That is a success factor for the military. They can govern. So now today, the military bombing the Bama majority area in Sakai and Makui, and then the killing, and then they're banning the houses. So most of the, uh, for the moment, the military already banned down over 300,000, uh, 30,000 public properties, mainly in the Sakai and Makui. Now people understand that the military just look at us and them. They have no discrimination. It doesn't matter race, religion, or ethnicity. If they think that they are, the person or that group is their enemy, they will annihilate. So that is why now people are getting to know each other and sharing the sympathy, empathy. Now new generation, the Generation Z apologize to the Rohingya community. Oh, we didn't understand. Your, your situation. Now people suffer at the same degree and then understand each other. So that is why now bombardization is the want and then people understand there is a mechanism specially created by the military. Can I just jump in for a minute and just, just say, we need to also understand that the acting president of the NUG is Kachin and he is not an LD. The prime minister is Karen and his background is NLD. Mm. So we are seeing people from the ethnic nationalities now playing a major role. Um, if there was one thing, apart from the, uh, the, the protection of human rights, or in addition, if there's one thing that I think the NUG should have as a priority, it's scrapping the old Citizenship Act and enacting a new one uh, as a matter of urgency. Mm. Um, there is nothing that represents the old Myanmar, the bad Myanmar, like the Citizenship Act did. And nothing could be a stronger expression of a new democratic nation of Myanmar than a new Citizenship Act. And they have the means to do it through the, the committee representing the national, the federal parliament, um, as Dr. Tun has said. It has passed a couple of laws already. So there is no constitutional or legal reason why the CRPH could not move on the Citizenship Act, but that's needed. Thank you, thank you. Now we'll say also to be 
less hierarchical because in you know, Myanmar culture, we are very hierarchical, boss is a boss, you know, dare not talk back, listen, listen. Perhaps, um, yeah, perhaps time to shake it up, loosen up a bit, you know, in terms of letting other voices to, to come out. Yeah. Now looking ahead, the military has indicated that they're gonna hold an election about middle of next year. So depending on the, the reaction, the acceptance or not of the outcome of this election, that will have some ramifications in the region internationally. So um, a question to Chris. To Chris, do you think the international community, at least in the Asia Pacific region, how are they gonna react to when we get the outcome of this um, sham election? The military um, clearly sees an election as the way out of the dilemma that it's put itself in. It's got itself into this position, uh, but it, it, it's not going to work. Mm. You know, firstly, an election is not necessary. We had an election in Myanmar late in 2020. It was considered to be over, overwhelmingly generally free and fair. There were some parts where it was not conducted. It was not a total election, but it was pretty good. And the results do reflect the, the opinion of the people. Um, that parliament was elected for five years. Um, it's only now two years into, not even two years into the life of that parliament. There is no need for a new election when we have a legally elected parliament and it has selected legal ministers, a legitimate government. Second, the military is changing the, the, the rules of the game. And so the election cannot have any legitimacy simply because it will change the rules and it will control it. Um, it's not going to make again the same mistake as it made in 2015 and 2020 and allow a free expression of the will of the Myanmar people. And the third thing is that even if it wanted to conduct a free and fair election, it is incapable of doing so. The military controls less than half the country. Um, it is not physically able to conduct an election in more than half the country. So I think that even for states that will want to see a way out of the problem, even for them, it's going to be very difficult to accord any legitimacy to this election. But the military, I think, particularly Min Online, um, who has traditionally been very close to Prayot, the former Thai military leader who converted himself into a civilian military leader. Uh, and I think that Min Online sees the Thai model as the way in which he wants to go. Well, it's barely worked in Thailand, but it ain't going to work in Myanmar. So you're feeling fairly confident that this, um, the, the, the result of the election will not be widely accepted, you know, especially in the Asia Pacific region, because it looks like the you know, military craze for international legitimacy, international approval, especially what would determine break, make or break in our view is that the regional, regional uh, legitimacy, regional acceptance. So I think it is fairly regional focused. And um, so, so your assessment is that it wouldn't be pretty hard to be accepted. Um, so Seattle and Shea, what do you think, um, do you agree with uh, Chris's assertion about the outcome of the election or there is some, some obstacles that we need to overcome in, in terms of this outcome being accepted by our Asian neighbors? Thank you so much. This is really, really important. So uh, please let me share a UG perspective or a UG uh, consideration on this uh, the election preparing by the military these days. So the first point from the political point of view, politically, that some ASEAN nations, as a member state, and then some neighbor of Myanmar, thinking that that upcoming election organized by military may be a solution for the current conflict. But from a UG point of view, totally wrong, it's totally wrong. Because if you look at the history of Myanmar, each and every military takeover 
proliferate the conflict in Myanmar, never end. In 1958, when the military takeover from the civilian government, Kachin and the Shan rebellion, uh, rebellions started. And in 1962, other ethnic groups. In 1988, spread more. 2021, last year, spread all over the country. Military takeover is not the solution. And then this military organized election is not a solution. That is from the political point of view. And also the technical point of view. You know, now 1.4 million people, internally displaced people, 1.4 million. And over 30,000 public properties, the, the civilian homes are already banded down. So in this situation, we can imagine then Myanmar, uh, Myanmar Electoral Commission's voter list is reliable or not, valid or not. And then the right of the voter is, can military guarantee for the rights of the voter? With 1.4 million internally displaced people, thousands, thousands of the public home, people home of Tanita, that is technical. So with technical reason, with political reason, Absolutely, that election is not a solution. But I already mentioned, the NUG already put on the table the sustainable solution. That is constitutional assembly, drafting the new constitution, then the referendum, then the election. That is the election people, people in Myanmar want to see and they're hoping for the new mission. But for the moment, international actors putting ASEAN on the forefront, the driving seat, and then that they like to sit on the rear seat, the pushing ASEAN. And then it didn't work. We already witnessed one over one and a half years. Mm -hmm. Nothing is progress. <laughs> no. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sadly, international support and reaction to Myanmar crisis has been underwhelming, to say the least. So now we've come to a um, conclusion. So Many I would like to ask whether the, the, regardless of the outcome of the election, do you think what kind of ch uh, challenges, human rights challenges that the country is facing ahead in the coming months? <laughs> um, so just to note, regardless of the election, because yes, we mustn't give it any credibility. We mustn't give any legitimacy towards the junta. Um, and we must dismantle this military. So regardless of what happens, if this military is still there, we're going to see just a perpetuation of this violence, um, a culture of violence, and uh, the same attacks by military on civilian populations that go unpunished. It's not an option to have these people there. That's that's really important to note. We, we have to, in our work, try to shorten the amount of time that they can be there. And just to go back to the note about Asian partners, I am really worried because it's been an underwhelming response from our corner to Australia. You know, Australia has a lot to answer for in its lack of response. Why have we been so hesitant? Why have we been, you know, a failed leader in regards to human rights. This is not okay in a democratic government when we expect more, we vote for that. Sean Turnell is now out um, and others in the room may have more information about that. But, you know, as far as I know, it wasn't really due to Australian leadership. It's circumstantial. And as Chris says, a very erratic military who we can't really predict. And if anyone says to you they know what's, go what's going on in Myanmar, you know they're lying. Um, but in terms of the future, it's not a good outlook. You know, it's quite grim. And especially for young people, what's their future? What are they going to do? We already have something like 40,000 people at the border with Thailand who cannot leave Thailand, who cannot go back to Myanmar. Um, you know, where is the international response to that humanitarian crisis? We have humanitarian crisis inside the country where the military doesn't allow aid to go to people in need. 
and they're bombing them and then people are running away and then they're not even allowing people to access life-saving aid. This is not tenable. The situation cannot be more protracted than it is. Um, you know, we need the international pressure to really ramp up because certainly internally there's not going to be any accountability except for the very people who are suffering and they're giving their lives for it. Um, this is not something that sits well with me. And, you know, ultimately, I think as much pressure, concerted efforts that are cohesive um, internationally, that's the way that we're going to go. And especially with the work from what, you know, Chris has done and laid down as a foundation, it is Absolutely. It's like the Bible to me. You know, we have to, I, I read it every week because I'm looking for avenues to try and get to these people. Um, and you mentioned before, sorry, that they care about international reputation. One thing they care more about that is money. So we need to cut the revenue flow and ensure that they don't become more enriched by this. With that, I have hope or hope or I relied on the international financial systems, the international banks to act, and they're the slowest to act. So I think that's where the hopes are pinned, but it's the hardest mountain to move. And uh, one of our activist girls said, um, when we had uh, meetings with Australian authorities, they mentioned, we wrote a lot of statements, a lot of statements, more than they would to Ukraine anyway. Then the, the girl said, we don't want statements. We want action. We want action. Term for your turn to now. Um, I'm sure you, you have a lot of questions simmering. Could you um, ask questions in a short and sharp way? It's not time for speeches. Speeches are outside. So here, just a short and sharp question, please. Thank you. Thank you all so much. So interesting to listen. I'm Sarata from RMIT University and Business and Human Rights Centre. I just wanted to direct a question to Chris. Um, I feel like it's extremely important, like um, Manny was saying, to find out where is the military getting their money from. And as you mentioned, you did this fact-finding mission a few years ago. What can we do? How can organisations work together to really outline in a transparent way ways to take action on this today and what it looks like. Is it possible? What are those steps? Um, any recommendations on that? I think the plan is we're going to take three questions and then we're going to answer. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, uh, so just following on from that, just wondering what uh, sanctions, uh, what are the holes in the sanctions regime? You know, what, what does the international community and particularly Australia, what can they do uh, to shift uh, uh, the politics here? Yes. I have a question um, for the to, to NUG representative. What are the specific demands of NUG to the international governments, including Australian governments? And what are their responses? Thank you. We have first two questions are concerning sanctions and why they haven't imposed. What are the loopholes in that. I don't think there are loopholes in the rule, but that they have to use it. There's a law there, they have to use it. I'll let uh, Chris answer this. Thank you. Very quickly then, um, there are many loopholes, and that's largely because the United Nations is so dysfunctional, <laughs> but it, it has not imposed universal sanctions. Um, so individual states or groups of states have taken up the task in the absence of action by the UN Security Council. 
and so far as Australia is concerned, um, it's almost non-existent. There were some sanctions imposed by Australia in 2018 um, after the Rohingya crisis of 2017, but Australia has not taken a single economic step in relation to Myanmar since the coup was launched in February last year under either the former government or the new government. Not one. And you ask what Australia can do. Well, we are, I mean, we don't have huge trade with Myanmar, but we can stand with other countries that have taken action. Um, we should be engaged with two other countries that have not taken action, and that is Japan and the Republic of Korea, who are close to us in this region and who are far more economically influential in Myanmar than we are. And we should be very supportive, particularly of Indonesia, the incoming ASEAN chair, um, who will be far more active on Myanmar than Cambodia has been this year. So there are opportunities there, but we need, we, we keep on asserting that we're a regional player, that we're a middle power. Um, we're not a regional player and we're not a middle power. We're small fry and we refuse to exercise even the small amount of influence that we can. And it's about time we did. I think where the Myanmar concern, just a quick um, um, observation, um, is that Australia is considering Myanmar as one of the Asian states, ASEAN states, and leave it to the very incapable hands of ASEAN to sort it out. Perhaps Myanmar isn't important enough, not rich enough to, to, for Australia to solve this, but they have to take a, not an economic approach, has to have a value-based approach to defend human rights. That's where Australia can play a big role. Thank you. Now we have um, Kainza's questions. NUG's, what demands NUG has made to the Australian government? What has been their responses? Thank you. Thank you. The question is really big. So in principle, so we work on the three three steps. The first step, we want to get appreciation from the Australian government, what I, and UG and CRB is doing. So without appreciation, we cannot expect support and even the recognition. So to get appreciation, we regularly inform Australian government and politicians what NUG is doing in terms of humanitarian, all this ministry doing. So we prepare the newsletter, regular updates to the government and politicians to get appreciation. The second thing, based on this appreciation, we seek an Australian government support to NUG. So for the moment, there is a, a, the challenge because Australian government oversee development assistance policy focus on the multilateral rather than the uni, uh, bilateral approach. So that is why in Australian government providing official assistance to Myanmar, including the humanitarian assistance, but through multilateral channel. So UN, ASEAN, and then the international NGO. But we are continue advocating to consider the bilateral uh, support. In terms of recognition, as uh, many mentioned, uh, I'm not sure who mentioned that, the recognition on the state, not government. So actually that is based on the international treaty. It's called Vienna Convention. So Vienna Convention is, about the international relation. So in this convention, state to state recognition, not government to government. Government to government is always changing. So that is why Australian government uh, told me and then the response to the NUG, we recognize state to not government. But now NUG office in Canberra, now Australian government had choice. So the, that the key issue is who do you like to work with? NUG or military? That is their choice. So now we have an office parallel. And then in terms of specific support, so for example, in these days, so as uh, Chris mentioned that, that now Indonesia are going to uh, lead the ASEAN, the chairmanship is coming. And then as you know, Australian government uh, allocate 92 million for the over uh, official development assistance. And on top of that, additional 335 millions for the humanitarian. 
So similarly, EU and US providing more assistance to Myanmar. But on the other hand, all these international aid agencies, including UN, facing a lot of difficulties to reach out to those in need because of first, the exchange rate in Myanmar. The second, the military manipulating all these humanitarian assistance program, a lot of restriction. So that is why NUT proposed United UN Special Envoy Office to organize a inclusive donor forum. Thank you, Sia. That is really, yeah. so really that great. That is one lots, of the specific requests to the Austrian government. I think um, many wants to say something. <laughs> Sorry, I'll be really quick. Um, I, just on the note of the sanctions and targeted sanctions, um, I want to distinguish targeted sanctions we are urging for entities that are military owned or the military conglomerates that make the billions of dollars that they make every year. And um, it's not a blanket sanction that we saw back in the 80s and 90s where it really, really um, limited the way in which people could live and get access to livelihoods. So we're really trying to target these individual senior officials in the military and the junta officials, including now the state administrative um, council. So the other thing is at the UN level, um, our member states or member states of the UN and ASEAN member states, we need to pressure them to sign up and put pressure on the UN Security Council to put in an arms embargo. There are many things that we can do other than just targeted sanctions, but right now there's a big debate about whether or not the UN Security Council can even pass a resolution that can put in an arms embargo. So these are some of the things that we will need to keep putting pressure on. Sorry. Thank you. Couple of online questions we are gonna take before we finish. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question here. What is NUG stand on the Rohingya issue? And a second question for people working in universities in Australia, um, what advice can you give us about what actions we can take uh, in our workplaces for the defense of human rights in Myanmar? Thank you. Thank you. Rohingya issues, um, what's NUG's um, vision? Thank you. Just a quick answer. Thank you. In the uh, policy, policy position statements regarding the Rohingya, NUG clearly defined that NUG guarantee for the dignified repatriation of the Rohingya people and then the, the, the settlement in Myanmar that already mentioned in the policy paper. That's a key point. And also, NUG is regularly engaged with Rohingya community, their leaders, and even the Rohingya advisor is working as part of the advisory team of the military of, and Ministry of Human Rights. So we are closely working. And then you may know seven years of the uh, anniversary of the Rohingya crisis. And then the acting president, Duwala Sheila and NUG leaders, they met Rohingya community in Korpusa by online. So these are the things happening. Thank you. So the, to answer the second question, what the academia can do, look, for Myanmar crisis, we all can do more. We all have more to do. So what, what we notice, which we cannot overcome for some reason, is that this fight against the military has been confined to Myanmar ourselves, you know, so inside Myanmar, they're fighting for themselves. Outside Myanmar, diaspora, we're fighting for ourselves without much of the outsiders, non burmese support, you know, let alone international community support. So I think that's where we have to uh, break out of the mold. And we, 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 we receive other people help to join our fights. So that's how uh, we, we, we can conclude with um, that, that, that message that come and join us, help us and um, yeah, assist us. So we have now discussed a lot of challenges ahead and a lot of opportunities in moving forward as well. But we, we feel that, you know, with the release of Professor Sean Turner, the international pressure is getting to the regime. This is a timetable's are turned, but the pressures have to 
keep on going and uh, heighten up, but uh, it, it is tipping the scale. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could you join me in thanking our brilliant, untiring panelists, please? Thank you. And thanks from um, the team at SEAC too, um, both to Tuetue for her chairing of this event, but also um, to the people behind the scenes that made this happen and to you, the audience. Um, really great questions, really great engagement. Um, and please spread the word. This event has been um, filmed. It will be online. So if you know people who might benefit from listening to the wisdom we've heard tonight, please encourage them to listen. Have a great night and thanks very much. See you soon at another SEAC event. <laughs>